The following is a segment from Ian Masters Live from the Left Coast. It's about 30 minutes and originally aired on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles. You can find more of Ian Masters' programs at ianmasters.com or at the KPFK archives at kpfk.org. And welcome to Life on the Left Coast. I'm Ian Masters. I'm speaking with Christine Wicker, who's an award-winning journalist and New York Times best-selling author who was raised in Oklahoma, Texas, and other parts of the South. Her mother's grandfather was an itinerant Baptist preacher, and her dad's father was a Kentucky coal miner. During her 17 years at the Dallas Morning News, she was a feature writer, columnist, and religion reporter. She is also the author of several books, including the highly acclaimed bestseller, Lily Dale, The True Story of the Town that talks to the dead, and not in Kansas anymore, dark arts, sex spells, money magic, and other things thy neighbors aren't telling you. Her new book, just published, is The Fall of the Evangelical Nation, The Surprising Crisis Inside the Church. And clearly, there's been a bit of a crisis week for John McCain. He's had to disavow the Reverend Hagee, uh, uh, Christine and uh, Rob Parsley, the Reverend Hagee, of course, uh, turned out uh, some time back, suggested that God unleashed uh, Hitler on the Jews in order to hunt them down and drive them into Israel to fulfill a biblical prophecy. And in the case of Rob Parsley, in a, a sermon, he suggested that it was the role of this Christian nation to destroy this false religion, Islam. Um, this is uh, this kind of dialogue, to my mind, is certifiably insane. So, as a culture, why have we allowed these people free reign to spout insanity and idiocy uh, without any uh, censure, and, and they're wrapped in the cloth? You know, the strangest thing to me is that we've not only allowed them um, media access, but we have the media. I, by, that's what I mean by we, because I was a religion reporter, so I'm guilty of a lot of this or uh, being complicit in it, is that we've also told the American people that these fringe prophets, since that's what they think they are, also have a large following that they are representative of evangelicals in America, and they simply are not. We have been duped. So, I mean, to my mind, of course, I come from Australia where people like this are referred to as God-botherers. And there's a, <laughs> there's a, a real sort of almost a genetic uh, 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 rejection of, of stealing that. these, these uh, uh, people. And they've always looked to me to be absurdly fraudulent. And, and they represent a kind of mercantilism that has never had a place in religion, If particularly if you look at, look at the Bible and, and you recall uh, Jesus throwing the money lenders out of the temple. And, of course, the, the famous admonition that uh, it's easy for a rich man to uh, ent- uh, enter the... It's easy, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So um, why is this uh, these people being able, have been able to thrive and prosper at the expense of the original intent, to use a, a phrase that they use on the Supreme Court with these fundamentalist justices we have? In other words, the fundamentalists are supposed to be about the text, and the, the original intention of the text, but the original intention of the text has nothing to do, by and large, with what they preach. In other words, Jesus didn't carry an assault rifle. He didn't hate homosexuals. He didn't celebrate capital punishment. Uh, he didn't fly around in a Learjet. In fact, he kissed the lepers uh, and ministered to the poor. Well, what some people say about um, evangelical faith is that it's not really Christian, it's Pauline. And so what you hear these types of Christians doing is talking more about Paul's letters to the churches. They tend to really be more an institution and an organization. And they also mix their Jesus with a lot of Americanism and a lot of capitalist ideas. Those things really meld together. And this is an important point because what we've been told is that one out of four Americans are evangelicals. And we've been told that because one out of four Americans say they are evangelicals. But the question is, what do they mean by evangelicals? In the public square, 
what we mean by evangelicals now is somebody like Heiji, um, somebody who is religious right political, anti-abortion, anti-gay rights, anti-taxes, um, someone who wants to um, change the way we do our political system and have God be a whole lot more in it. So that's why I talk about the fall of the evangelical nation. I'm really talking about those people who have come into the public square and become known as Christians to the point that almost no other religions or or Christians are even heard in the public square. And here's the way we've been duped. We have been told that these are one out of four Americans. They're not. They're not even close to one out of four Americans. They're one out of 14 Americans. And the reason that I know that is because as I was researching this book, I intended to do the usual book, praising evangelicals, seeking out the most extreme of them. I was going to try not to do that, but I was going to talk about how big, how great, how powerful they were. But evangelicals all throughout, I went back to Texas where I'm from, to a big evangelical church, and people kept saying to me, you're doing the wrong book. Look at the back door. Look who's going out that door. Look at why we can't save anybody. One of the two of the ministers said to me, "If the rapture were to come today, because they, these, they do believe in the rapture, some of them do, some of them don't. This one did. He said, if the rapture were to come today, half the people would show up in this church on Sunday wondering where everybody went." <laughs> so. If indeed, I'm reading between the lines here, if indeed uh, evangelical, uh, the, the noise that's coming, which is disproportionate uh, to the numbers um, and the domination of the spectrum, if you will, of religious discourse in this country, uh, is if, if indeed it's a, a front for right-wing politics, which I think is what it, it's largely become, um, what's, what's wrong with the religious left? Why can't they get off the ground? Well, part of the reason the religious left can't get off the ground is the media really won't pay any attention to them. That's starting to change just a little bit. But notice where it's coming from. It's still coming from the right. It's those on the right are changing. Well, I tell you, it's really happened. And if you look at Mother Jones, you'll see that one they, an evangelical reporter wrote about this book in this, this month's edition, and she really got it. She said they claimed a bunch of people who didn't even know they were being claimed. So some of those people were the religious left or the religious middle or the religious uncommitted. These, this one out of 25, uh, one out of four people, 25% of America contains 18%. 18% of those people don't even know they're being called the religious right. They don't act like the religious right. They don't vote like the religious right. They don't think like the religious right. And their theology is not like the religious right. So there's a vast, um, array of people who will cop to the title evangelical. Why will they do that? Well, because evangelical is a cultural term now. It's a kind of cultural religion, for instance, in the South and in the Midwest. Lots of kids get saved in their teenage years. It's almost a rite of passage. So they may call themselves evangelicals for the rest of their lives, but in fact, they're not. They're not anything like evangelicals. And even when they do go to these churches, they practice what's being called consumer religion. And what that means is they go to those churches just like they patronize McDonald's. They like McDonald's. They talk about McDonald's. They take their friends to McDonald's. But does McDonald's rule their life? Is it the only kind of food they eat? No, not at all. Well, in McDonald's case, I hope it's not. <laughs> they're, going to, they're going to end up with serious uh, health problems. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, your point's well taken because I, I I've saw that 60 Minutes piece on Joel Osteen, the young uh, a preacher down there in uh, Dallas, I think, um, who you know says God wants you to be a winner. God doesn't want you to be a whiner. I mean, it's complete uh, you know motivational speaking. So. If they've ca- if they've managed to lure people in, uh, you know, that, that want to get rich and and uh, you know the I guess who was that famous person that started all this motivational stuff? I can't remember his name now. Dale uh, Carnegie. Dale Carnegie. Yes. There you go. That's, that's, yes. It's a sort of there. What about the new age people? I'm trying to get again figuring out why the the uh, majority, the silent majority of people are, are, are so passive when the active minority have captured the high ground and dominated the headlines. So 
Explain to me why the, the passivity and how much it's because the of the New Age people, by sort of definition, to some extent, are navel gazers. Well, I mean, that's, that's true. That's my my take on exactly. it. Exactly. You don't have to share that. It, in <laughs> fact, that's the media's take on it. The reason that they love the religious right is because the religious right people will say what they mean, and they say it in a very colorful way. Mm. Uh, be winners, not whiners. That's a great so- sound bite. Where the others kind of, we call it mushing out. I used to try to cover the peace movement. Every year they'd have a conference. Every year I'd try to cover it, and every year I'd say, what am I going to write? I mean, who doesn't like peace? It would just, it's hard to get a handle on. It's really easy to get a handle on the religious right. Here's the other thing that they did. Everybody makes fun of New Agers. Well, they don't have an organization. They don't picket you. They don't uh, call and complain. They don't say you're going to hell because you make fun of them. The religious right was able in the 1980s to figure out what their causes were going to be. Opposition to gay rights, abortion. They very specifically chose abortion. Did you know that the Southern Baptists didn't originally win, uh, win, um, when the, um, when the Supreme Court ruled that abortion would be, um, allowed in the United States, Southern Baptist, which is the largest evangelical group in the country, didn't protest at all. They thought it was a fine idea. Then a group of people decided that they were going to move the convention and, and evangelical thought to the right, to the fundamentalist direction, and they were going to get political control. So they very consciously chose different issues. And then what they did, I really think Rove had to be behind this, although he might not have been, but they began to intimidate the media and, and other Christians. They put out the word that mainline Christians were communists. They got on 60 Minutes with that one even. Mm. They put out the idea, they began to foment deliberately. They sent in people to foment dissension in those other churches. They began to do what we call rustling the sheep, which is they began to take other Christians from other denominations. They began to call themselves, for instance, Bible-based. And they used these terms, partial birth abortion, and the press picked them right up. And part of the reason is they also said the press is biased, the press is liberal. And any time the press did something they didn't like, they called those publishers. Now, the press is just like every other business. It responds to its customers. It, restr- it responds, especially now when the right. press is much weaker. Exactly. And so they were is- able to intimidate us right. and cause us to sort of back off. Right, indeed. The, the press are no different from politicians. If if you call them up, they take your call. And uh, uh, I wish put more people called their local congressman and read them the riot act. Again, I'm speaking with Christine Wicker, the author of The Fall of the Evangelical Nation, The Surprising Crisis Inside the Church. Now, the biggest denomination is, of course, the Catholic Church in, the, yes. in terms of the mainstream. And it seems to me that the Catholic Church, in it, it, having turned so far to the right, as it has since the, the Vatican II, uh, particularly under the predecessor, and of course the, the head of the doctrine is now the Pope, uh, who was the you know Ratzinger when he was Cardinal Ratzinger was the guy that basically the Inquisitor who who purged the the liberation theology out of the, out of the Catholic Church, even though he largely has been unsuccessful because um, there are still Catholics who do the Lord's work. Uh, and toil in the fields, of, uh, uh, as the Bible uh, states. He, uh, I, it seems to me that th- that has been an enormous adjunct to the, what you're talking about, the fact that the largest mainstream church at its top in terms of its hierarchy, they've got four guys on the Supreme Court who share their views, uh, who are co- very conservative uh, um, Catholics, and the bond that they have with the evangelicals is over abortion. Of course, the Catholics are a little more consistent in their theology because they oppose capital punishment and, and war as well. But don't you think that that has been an enormous uh, help to uh, the evangelicals? Two things have happened with the Catholics. Uh, one is that they, the evangelicals who, when I was a child in the evangelical South, were scorned as not even Christians. We thought they were idol worshippers and um, called them that whenever, the great whore. <laughs> whenever we could. The great whore, that's right. Uh, we, we didn't mince words with those Catholics. But as you, you can see the political shift 
uh, that's gone on because now the Southern Baptists and the Evangelicals have embraced the Catholics because of their um, opposition to abortion, as you said, although the Evangelicals don't embrace the full uh, pro-life uh, um, position of the Catholics in that they want the death penalty, of course, and they don't want to help the poor in the way that Catholics traditionally have. But, th- but that has happened, so there's been this alliance with the more conservatives, but then there's also been a lot of sheep stealing from the Catholics because what the evangelicals say to them is you can come, you can look at the Bible, you can translate the Bible for yourself, and you get forgiveness. And so you have that working. It's, it's interesting because... Um, what you have the Catholics and they're, they're being, uh, having their sheep led astray into the evangelical camp. And then you have the to Southern Baptist. <laughs> That's right. To get fleeced. <laughs> um, and you've got 16 million. Let, let's talk a minute about numbers because this mm-hmm. is where w- my profession really failed and me among them. The Southern Baptists say they have 16 million members. The Catholics say they have about 23 million. All the churches numbers are wrong. The Catholics enroll you at birth and you never get out. A lot of those Catholics have now become Baptists, but since they didn't go back and inform the Pope, who, who wouldn't have paid any attention anyway, they're still on the Catholic roll. So we have no idea how many Catholics there are. We also have no idea how many Southern Baptists there are. For instance, five to eight million of those Southern Baptists who are on the rolls don't even live in the city, same city where their churches are. So they certainly aren't going to church very often. The National Association of Evangelicals, this is one reason why they got such a loud voice, says they have 30 million members, 30 million people that they influence who follow their dictates. The press just, and myself among them, we just wrote it down, 30 million, 16 million, no problem. When I decided that I needed to follow the numbers, I was stunned at what I found out. There are perhaps 4 million Southern Baptist who can be counted in the way that Southern Baptists really count their members, and that's how many do you run in Sunday school. Sunday school is a big deal in Southern Baptist Church. You don't go to Sunday school or one of those Sunday Bible studies. You're not really a Baptist. Four million people, that's all go. Then I chased the numbers on the National Association of Evangelicals. They don't have 30 million. I looked at the churches. They have 7.6 million tops. We should have never given them the kind of megaphone that we did, and we wouldn't have if we'd known how many there really were. Really were. Now, when you talk about Catholics versus, versus evangelicals, a really interesting thing is you rarely hear about the Catholic vote anymore, and that's because we understand that Catholics are very different types. But evangelicals, we have yet to understand our different types. So what you hear right now, that I just, I just have to say this too, you keep hearing the religious right is breaking up. The religious right is just losing the people that it never really had. Hmm. That seven, religious right makes up about 7% of the population. They're laying low right now, hmm. but they haven't changed. Well, Christian Wiki, we, we've talked about how to some extent, the Catholic Church has formed a de facto alliance with the evangelicals over abortion. The other alliance that is a rather unholy one is the alliance, and it was manifested clearly when uh, the Reverend Hagee made his uh, uh, response to Senator McCain cutting him loose. Um, standing next to the Reverend Hagee was an Orthodox uh, rabbi from, I uh, believe, from San Antonio, um, who that exemplifies this, you know, strange ph- phenomenon called Christian Zionism, which is, uh, uh, and of course, Hagee's head of uh, Christians United for Israel. Uh, the thing that I find extraordinary, uh, uh, you know, since most uh, American Jews are, are quite liberal, um, why uh, have the, the Jews made this incredible alliance with these guys? Because as far as I can tell, the, the purpose of this alliance uh, is not to support and defend Israel. It's to encourage Israel to fulfill the biblical prophecy of the end of times so that, in effect, the Israelis are sort of biblical cannon fodder, if you will, for Armageddon. And they're supposed to trigger Armageddon. Uh, so that uh, there'll be lakes of blood and lakes of fire, and all Absolutely. of us will de- die, and you know we'll be consumed by 
fire and our burning flesh uh, uh, while uh, the righteous rise above us in, in the rapture. So right. in other words, in order for their world to begin, our world has to end in hideous pain. Um, I think that is and it's so hubristic a notion that I, uh, people should be enraged. They shouldn't. That these people should be treated uh, seriously for, for mental disorders. Well, there are two things there that I want to comment on. You made a correction. You said, why are the Jews doing this? And then you said, the Israelis. It's the Israelis. And the answer to that, you can sum up in one word, tourism. That's why they're doing it. <laughs> tourism. Tourism. There's a lot of tourism. <laughs> so it's just like to hell via the Holy Land. Is that how it works? Well, they don't. Oh, really, not, they don't believe this. They're going to heaven, right? Yes, yeah, they yeah. don't believe. The Jews don't believe this is going to happen anyway. They oh, think so it's, it's very, all nonsense. Uh, but there's a lot of Holy Land tourism going on, I and then see. it also gives them a little bit of an in there with uh, the Bushies and and that constituency in America. But I think a most very of, reliable constituency. Yes, yes, yeah. and most Americans aren't aren't going for that at all. What the other thing that's happened that's been a real shame in terms of the hegemony of the religious right, evangelicals in the public square is that the press will hardly ever cover the attitude of the Methodist and the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians toward Israel and toward the Palestinians. They have a much more balanced view. Um, they do have some um, sense of the suffering that the Palestinians have endured. And so but that has been seen as liberal, communist, socialist, right. anti-American. And, and the press has covered it. They've covered all these things, but there's no organized group that has mandated or has agitated for this to stay, to stay in the public eye. So those oh. stories just kind of fade away. Whereas what you had, very smart thing the religious right did, they took over the Republican Party. And then they had a really good bully pulpit to use with the press, and they did. But if you want to know how strong they are, listen to them talk a little bit. Their big complaint is that they never really get their issues passed. What the Republicans and, even, and the Democrats do to the religious right at this during the national elections is the same thing they they always used to do to black communities. They would go into the African-American communities, they would talk the talk, and forget them after they were elected. And although it may not seem that way if you read the press and if you're really frightened about the religious right, in truth, they've worked 30 years, abortion is still legal. They've worked 30 years, gay rights, as we saw here in California, is moving right ahead, it's not turning back. They've really had very few successes. And that's, and the reason is, there aren't that many of them. Well, the, hello, hello, it's democracy at work, isn't that's it? That's exactly right. Majority there, rule. Exactly. If there were 25, if 25% of American voters were religious right, mm -hmm. politicians would be falling all over themselves to do mm. what those people wanted. Well, what about the statistic there that 54 percent of Americans believe that the dinosaurs are on Noah's Ark and something like 16 or 18 percent of, of school teachers believe in creationism? When they talk about creationism, mostly what I believe those school teachers are talking about is they think that there was some, God had some hand in this. Americans have a lot of religiosity in their thoughts, and the mistake that people make, that journalists often make, is to think that human beings think in a logical, linear way. <laughs> they don't. None of them do. As you, you name some of my books, I can tell you, I've looked at thinking of human beings <laughs> in magical ways. And I can tell you, you have people who are very rational, very reasonable, and they believe all sorts of odd things. Like, for instance, um, angels get them parking places. You wouldn't believe how many people mm. believe that. Mm. And they're, they're not cuckoos. They just, they believe this. They're very quiet about it. So what happens is we hear these things. Most of Americans they don't really think that much about it. They, they find it, they're not scientists. They don't know very much about scientists. Mm. Science, so they really can accept Darwinism and creationism and God had his hand. And as for the ark, well, it's simply not a very big, de big deal in their lives. And so that's what we forget when we hear these polls. I'm watching TV. Some joker calls me on the phone. I don't know who he is. I'm listening with half an ear. He asks me. I answer. 
And that begins to be the gold standard for Americans. Like, for instance, any time you look at a religion poll, pay attention. When somebody says they're an evangelical, the pollster will say, this many people are evangelicals. Well, you don't know what they asked. You don't know how they categorized them, but you can know for sure but they, that they said they were evangelicals. Mm. And there was one question and no more questions, and, and then we put that out as fact. That is one of the things that is the problem with American media, and it's one of the reasons that the religious right could dupe us in such a huge way. So... Hagee's clearly on the defensive. I mean, this has not been good PR for him, and it's about time that he was smoked out because he does, he believes this stuff. I mean, he, he, he does, but he was always the nut fringe. Hmm. But what about even to evangelicals? Really? Oh yeah, they don't, they don't listen it, to Falwell. They don't listen to Robertson. Uh, 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 they don't listen to uh, James Dobson. L- let me tell you something. He just put out um, an email. Um, appeal to a million people. These are his core followers. James Dobson. Dobson. James Dobson. He's considered one of, focus on the family. He's considered one of the kingmakers. All the press, all the politicians, they all go to him to find out what the evangelicals are going to do. He says he's going to set out the election. Uh, Mm -hmm. He's not going to vote for McCain because he just can't stomach him. Okay, fine. That's a little bit of a threat. Most evangelicals don't even know who those people are. They give them their names. They say, I don't know who those guys are. Um, So here's what happened with him. He sends out a million emails. He's asking his core followers. These are people who he says he controls. He's asking them to do one thing. Push the enter button. Put your name on a petition to keep federal money from going to abortion providers such as Planned Parenthood. 30,000 people did it. Now, let me tell you something. If you told the truth about James Dobson and you said he's got 30,000 people who will do his bidding who will answer his emails on a core issue that they have been fighting for for 30 years, that would make him seem a lot different than a man who has a millions, a million mm-hmm. followers. They don't follow him very far. Well, just to, in closing, though, uh, Christine, what about the notion that these big mega churches like Osteen, like the, the New Age guy or the touchy-feely Christian guy, that wears the beach shirts, the Hawaiian shirts. I can't think of his name. Rick Warren. Rick Warren. All, how are they going to fare as the economy goes south, as people have to, families uh, have to sacrifice to fill up the minivan, uh, to buy food on the table? Um, do you think they're going to have the kind of cash flow that they clearly have? There's a chapter in the book called uh, the, crash, uh, the Crash of Giants about the megachurches. The megachurches are in big trouble, and they are the crown jewel of the evangelical um, nation. And uh, they're in trouble in just about every way. Uh, they've, they've built too much. They've overbuilt, and they have too much debt, and they're already running into trouble as the new generation starts to take over. And, and what's this new generation? Um, a quick... They call them Gen X. They would be the 30s and the um, the 20s, 30s, and maybe the early 40s. Uh-huh. Uh, they're not going to give as much money. They don't go to churches much, uh, and they don't like the mega churches at all. Huh? In spite of the the Christian rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Always been pretty milk toast to my taste. <laughs> They've done everything they can to get them. And interestingly, those churches are beginning uh, to change their um, their approach because they know that they're losing out on their core members too. Well, they're it's been trouble. fascinating talking to you, uh, Christine Thank you. Wicker, to get statistics uh, at the core of what we've been led to believe is a powerful movement. But the figures just don't add up. And uh, I must say I'm greatly relieved because um, – I'm not ready to go to their heaven. (laughs) And thank you for joining us here in the studio. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Again, I was speaking then with Christine Wicker, who's an award-winning journalist, a New York Times bestselling author who was raised in Oklahoma, Texas, and other parts of the South. During her 17 years at the Dallas Morning News, she was a feature writer, columnist, and religion reporter. She's the author of several books, the latest of which has just come out, The Fall of the Evangelical Nation, The Surprising Crisis Inside the Church. I'm